Welcome back to this uh, second half of the workshop uh, where we'll be looking at uh, clinical trials and communication. So we're very honored, um, well, I'll be sharing the, this second session and I'm very honored to introduce our first speaker of the second session. Uh, Dr. Shou Yi Yun is lead scientist uh, in the domain of health and lifestyle at the Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of Risk. And she's also an assistant professor at the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health here at NUS. And she will be speaking on consent and risk communication in clinical trials under uncertainty. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Shou. Hello everyone and thanks very much Sumi for the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for attending this session. And I'm Yiyun Shou and I'm from psychology background and I've uh, been doing research on human psychology of risk and uncertainty over the past more than 10 years. Today I will talk about the, the concern, especially relevant to risk communication in clinical trials on the uncertainty. So it's more from human and psychology perspective. I think, um, thanks to the pre previous two speakers, I think they lay very good foundations for this particular session. So I think for Joe's session, Joe has already detailed very sufficiently on what is informed consent and why it is important for research, ethical and practical perspective. And uh, um, so Joe has already introduced a very, uh, like a different kind of definition uh, under the legal framework and under Singaporean context in terms of what is uh, informed consent. So here I just provide another, not another, a similar definition but provided by everybody knows them PubMed, right? So this is definition provided provided in mesh term in PubMed. So here is a bit more strict say the informed consent requires full comprehension of the risk involved in the research. So and um, I think some of you, uh, especially who are doing research in clinical trials, you possibly know some problems around consent. And the first thing definitely the most important thing concerned by researchers are the low consent rate or the high consent refusal in clinical trials. So if you do not have a sufficient number of people to join your research, you cannot finish the trial on time or you do not have sufficient power to detect the effect in the clinical trial. And also from the ethical and other perspective, even though you get a consent, there are wide kind of concern around the quality of the consent. Whether people have like high quality of consent or they have no idea what's going on, they just, they just say yes to researchers or to the doctor. And then now, let's start with the, low, the problem around the low consent rates. So I think it's widely known that there are a lot of difficulties in recruitment in clinical trials. And uh, the recruitment has already been difficult enough, but if uh, you also happen to have very low consent rate, so every like when in two patients say no to your, your in invitation, it's going to have a bigger problem in terms of reaching your target sample size. Oh, it's actually working. So it turns out I did not turn on <laughs> the, 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 the controller, okay. Uh, and uh, um, in a research on the um, randomized controlled trial, RCTs, and conduct conducted in UK over the past uh, two decades, they found that less than half of the, the trials actually reach the original target sample size. And the median consent rate is only about a 72 percentage. So this systematic review uh, is done in the UK context. What about, what about in other countries, especially countries which is not a high income? So it's kind of difficult to do a, a research over all the clinical trials because it's going to be too huge. So we just do um, like a research just for RCTs for critically ill patients. So for the clinical, uh, for the RCTs for clinical ill patients, they have additional challenge in recruitment and the consent. So for example, usually they have very strict criteria of enrollment. You need to be, uh, have certain kind of condition in order to get into the trial. 
And also, they usually have very narrow enrollment uh, uh, window. So you need to have a certain time frame be between the onset of the condition and the last uh, the deadline you can enroll the patient into the RCT. And because if a patient is critically ill, they sometimes are too sick to give the informed consent. So we did a scoping review of the RCTs in critically ill patients with a serious infection since 2010, so it's about a 10 year period of RCTs. And uh, we select 120, uh, 112 studies, and uh, among the studies, um, just about half of studies um, were conducted in high income countries, and we also have seen increasing amount of studies conducted conducted in upper middle income countries and especially the lower middle income countries. Possibly most of you are aware of uh, more recent RCTs are more increasingly conducted in low income countries like African countries and uh, South American countries. And uh, for those studies, um, the majority of the RCTs are comparative trials and uh, about uh, one quarter of the trials are on minors which are children or babies. So from this scoping review, here are some of the key observations. Um, so for the RCTs that we can find the information about the plant sample size, about one third of the studies, they did not meet. And it did not meet the target sample size. And uh, um, more than half of the studies report losing, losing patients due to consent problems. So here, I only indicate um, about half of the studies indicate information for the rest of the studies does not mean there's no consent refusal information. It's just as simply we cannot find information about a consent refusal and uh, uh, um, consent rate. So among the studies that actually reported the, the consent loss, um, in general, the, the median loss due to consent issues is around a certain percentage. But we also observe difference across different uh, countries with different income levels. And the more specifically, we definitely observe a higher median loss rate among high income countries compared to the lower middle income countries. So the median loss rate for the high income countries is around 70 percentage, while the median rate is only 6 percentage for um, low middle income countries. And uh, additional thing we observe in this scoping review is there are huge difference across different trials. Despite we observe the median rate as a certain percentage, the, the range can be huge. Some of the studies actually have more patients refuse to consent than the actual number of patients enrolled in the trial. So we do see a lot of uh, difference across, across different trials. So what are the barriers of consent? So across different, uh, there have been a lot of studies carried out in the literature trying to understand what are the enablers and the and, uh, and barriers of people to say yes to a clinical research or clinical trial. And uh, a, lot of the, the, um, a lot of the factors are related to the trial. So the trial related consideration such as the uh, health risk and benefit, definitely the top priority of patients would consider whether they want to get into a trial or not. And uh, also the time of, and, uh, and uh, efforts, and whether they need to uh, spend a lot of time in the trial and uh, logistics, whether they need to come to visit the hospital very often. And also they definitely consider potential financial costs and the reimburse associated with the trial. And uh, more recently, patients have become increasingly concerned about the privacy and the confidentiality about uh, their data. And uh, uh, so other factors um, become uh, um, aware of, um, become um, increasingly um, get aware of is the uh, communication of trial risk and uncertainty. So you have all the risk information, uncertainty information about a trial. But to ex what extent people have informed consent? And it depends on actually how you communicate the trial information. So again, I just reiterated the definition from the MASH term. It requires full comprehension of the risk in order to achieve informed consent. But unfortunately, despite a lot of guidelines, such as a good clinical guideline has been released over the past years, 
Little has been changed in terms of patient understanding of research over the past two decades. And uh, what kind of thing can cause uh, the poor comprehension and even misperception of risk among patients and the consent givers? And uh, it's definitely something we can, can guess from the previous session is how well a child's risk and uncertainty is communicated with consent giver. And also, that something um, should be also taken into account is how the consent giver actually interpret and perceive the risk. So we did a, um, another systematic review. We tried to understand what are, are the potential problems around informed consent and risk, risk communication. And we focus on the RCTs, especially the antibiotic RCTs, um, published uh, over the past uh, two decades. And uh, um, not many articles talk about the problems, uh, but fortunately, we found 29 articles discuss the problem around informed consent and risk communication relevant to the antibiotic RCTs. And uh, um, many of them describe the pers um, perspectives from experts or uh, doctors. And then we also find some articles describe perceptions from patients and the consent givers. So here are some key observations. And uh, the first one is uh, informed consent and full comprehension are very challenging. And uh, some like and doctors and experts, they indicate it's impossible to achieve full informed consent in clinical trials. And uh, the reason behind this is, is first, the risk uncertainty are a natural component of research. If there's no uncertainty, there's no point for when to do research, right? So uncertainty is a natural component of our research. And uh, also, lack of understanding and the misunderstanding of research are very common among patients and their representatives. So I think for some of the healthcare professionals here and the researchers here, it's kind of not uncommon to observe you have difficulty to communicate or difficult to get the patients to fully understand what's going on and the risk associated with that procedure. And uh, the second thing is a problem with informed consent forms. I think Joe has already described a lot of problems in this area. So the consent givers can be put off by the lengthy information sheet. If you have very long information sheet, people do not bother to read in details. And some consent forms poorly inform the trial information as uh, Joe has already described. And, um, and also another problem is uh, even though you describe the, the, the consent form, has uh, all the information available. Participants may not interpret the information in the consent form as what is intended to be conveyed. And uh, the second problem, uh, the, the next problem is, um, not a problem, the next crucial thing is uh, doctors and the research staff, they play a crucial role in communication. So it's not only the form, the paper you give and to the patient and the consent givers. The whole process, actually a lot of things are, are done by doctors and the research staff. They try to explain things and communicate the trial information with the patients. The problem is that sometimes doctors and the research staff can also have their own misunderstanding or biases in relating to the scenario relating to the trial. So if they have their own misunderstanding of bios, you can imagine that the information get communicated to the patient is going to be problematic. And, uh, and uh, I, I think everybody has uh, um, possibly can, can have the similar experience. Patients and representatives, they usually trust doctors and research staff. They rely on doctors and they because you rely on and trust the doctors, they can be influenced by opinions of doctors and how doctors frame the, the, the trial information and frame the risk inside the trial. And other things observed in our systematic review is uh, a lot of the time, people find that it's a certain time pressure. They do, not find, uh, they do not feel they have sufficient time to make a decision, to read the form appropriately, to digest the information appropriately. And also, the very, very, the very widespread phenomenon is uh, and there are high emotional distress taking place and in the, during the process. Think about the patients and the representative. 
they have been experiencing the disease the condition. With the health problems, it's already distressed enough. Now you put, in, put them into additional kind of scenario where here is a trial that is more uncertainty, then a lot of anxiety, fear, worry can take place during the consent process. Now, how do these things relate to consent and the risk? Now, um, we try to understand how people actually perceive risk benefit relating to a trial. And, uh, and a lot of research in psychology, like there have been decades of research in psychology, try to understand how people perceive risk and how people process information. So definitely the trial-related information, such as the information presented to, uh, to the patient's representative, as a key information will be used by a decision maker, maker to perceive risk and benefit. And also the uncertainty around the trial can also be relevant to the risk and the benefit perception. So for these two factors, they are definitely trial-related information. And uh, ideally, if you want people to do a rational decision, they should rely on those information, trial-related information. Unfortunately, people are not such simple. They are also influenced by a lot of factors that is not relevant to the trial. So what are those factors? So first, the first two factors are cognitive processing and the how information is presented. So the cognitive processing, the people need to process information in order to understand the risk inside the trial or inside the information. And uh, people can be influenced by certain things and not relevant to the trial. So one particular thing is uh, how easy do they find to process information? Suppose there are two um, consent forms. If they, like uh, the two consent information, uh, consent form, they describe the same trial, they describe the same risk information. But if one consent form is easier to understand and easier to process than the other one, people will be more likely to accept information and even like they are going to feel low risk, like uh, they, are, they are going to perceive low risk and uh, lower uncertainty relevant to the, the, the consent form, which is easier to process than the consent form, which is more difficult to process. So as Joe indicated, like uh, uh, indicated in the previous session, a lot of consent forms nowadays are very difficult to digest, very difficult to process. So if you have like a process difficulty on top of the trial information, people will perceive higher risk than the actual risk inside the trial during this process. And also how you present the information can influence how people perceive risk. So there are different ways to present the risk information such as the probability and the frequency and also uh, verbal phrases. But how you describe presented information can influence their risk perception. I will describe this a bit later in, uh, in the later session of this talk. And uh, other things is uh, people's pride, belief, and knowledge can also influence how they interpret and perceive risk in a current trial. And uh, everybody has their own previous experience and previous knowledge about what a, a, a clinical trial should be and uh, what is the general risk a clinical trial uh, should involve. If a person um, before participating in a trial, they by reading all the newspaper articles or seeing all the movies, the terrible movies, they say like uh, clinical trials are all very terrible things. And even though the trial itself is not risky, their pride belief can influence how they interpret the risk inside the current trial. And more importantly, emotion can influence how people perceive risk. So giving a, like even uh, giving a same individual reading the same piece of information, if they are in a negative mode or very anxious mode, they are going to perceive risk as higher if, uh, compared to if the person is in a very calm or even positive mode, despite it's the same person, despite the same piece of information. But the emotional feeling experienced by the person can influence the risk perception of the person.
So thinking about all the clinical trials, as we described in the, the previous review, literature review, it's very commonly observed that the patients and the representatives, representatives, they experience high emotional distress. So you can imagine that they actually, it can heighten their risk perception, despite the actual risk in the trial may not be such high. Now, so, one thing, uh, like as we observe, is that as a common misunderstanding of research um, among patients and representatives, definitely the trial information and the communication can be a reason. But also, as I described, the prior belief and knowledge can also influence how people perceive risk. And uh, um, unfortunately, there are not a lot of local studies carried out in Singapore at the moment. A lot of research are carried out in Western countries and, in, and other English-speaking countries. So, so at the moment, um, my master's student and I have been doing a pilot study trying to understand how Singaporeans um, perceive clinical research in general. Are there any misunderstanding of clinical research among si Singaporean general population? And uh, um, we carry out a pilot survey study. Just to keep in mind, it's a pilot study. It's not a, a very huge sample, but it's just a small study. But it has already revealed some interesting findings I would like to share with you. So some of the results is uh, we found that half of the Singaporean participants, they believe consent is only required for clinical research that involve, involve drug treatment. And uh, more than half of the participants believe hospitals that participate in medical research provide better care, which may not be true, right? And 68% uh, of participants believe, as they are not sure, say pregnant women cannot participate in medical research. And uh, three quarters of uh, our participants believe or not sure, say some people always get a drug, while others, people, uh, other pe others do not get in medical research, which is not true. And uh, about half of the participants believe that medical research is only conducted by large pharmaceutical companies. So here, even in the Singaporean context, where the majority of the Singaporeans have relatively high education compared to, say, other countries like uh, uh, lower and middle income countries, you still see people have a somewhat spread misunderstanding of clinical research. All the misunderstanding will be, um, will be carried over and influence their risk perception when you try to approach them for a clinical trial. Mm. Now, uh, let's talk about the next topic, the, the risk communication in SATs. And uh, as we described, uncertainties uh, are the major challenge in risk communication in SATs. Because at the time you try to communicate with the patients, not all risks have been known. And associated with the, the, the medication, you can only based on your best knowledge at the time you conduct a trial to communicate information. So as a one reason of the uncertainties in SATs, a lot of unknowns around the disease, and uh, around the trial intervention. And there are different uh, kind of unknowns. The first thing is the probability, which is also sometimes we call as a risk, is uh, the probability of an, an outcome is not a, like zero percentage or 100 percentage, it's not a certain. And uh, also, you also have ambiguity. Not only you do not know whether there's the probability, uh, um, um, in addition to that, you do not know whether the outcome is certain or not. Sometimes you do not know the probability of the outcome. You can only know roughly, possibly, uh, 20 to 50 percentage likely an outcome is going to happen or not. And sometimes even you do not know the probability of an outcome. And also, we also have sample space ignorance, especially for new drug intervention. And a lot of the outcomes may not be reported. So you actually do not know what are the potential unknown outcomes relating to a trial and intervention. And um, like just to recall that participants are, uh, sometimes are not, uh, they may not interpret information as uh, the information intend to convey. So we also have uncertainty actually can be caused 
by communication. As I described, the way to communicate risk and in RCTs, you can have numeric information. You can provide actually precise probability information or frequency information, say, um, like when in 10 patients are likely to experience certain kind of side effect. And uh, the other one is also commonly used is the verbal phrase, such as likely, common, and rare. I think you commonly observe this in patient information leaflets. And also not only say information leaflets, it's also more commonly used in uh, actual medical practice between, uh, in the communication between doctors and the patients. So sometimes the verbal phrases, they are preferred because they are more natural, they are more personal. You feel like more personal when you communicate with patients about the likelihood of an outcome. And, uh, and they are easier to understand compared to numbers. Because numeric information would require the person to have numeracy, which is the literacy of numbers, in order to understand the risk. But for the verbal phrases, they usually they can be easier to understand for patients with the low numeracy. But the problem of verbal phrase is uh, they are vague. And uh, because it's vague, they allow more individual difference in interpreting them when judging risk and the probability. So here is a study, I'm not sure, sorry, it's very small, but here is a figure that captures lay people's interpretation of different probability phrase. The bottom one is impossible and you have never, very unlikely, and the top one are always, certain and almost certain, and they vary the degree of certainty in verbal description of likelihood of, in, of an outcome. So here, as, a, as an example said, um, an example of um, how lay people can have different interpretation given the same phrase. Even for the imp impossible and the never, Never, you still see certain kind of individual difference. Not everybody think impossible means zero percentage, and not everybody think always means 100 percentage. And for some of the term like uh, maybe and possible and uh, probably, you have a wider spread of uh, people's interpretation on the meaning behind these terms. And uh, um, so I just have a quick illustration of our recent experimental study. So our recent experimental study, we try to examine um, probability judgments of outcome in medical scenarios communicated by doctors using those verbal phrases. We try to understand how individuals and lay people interpret these verbal phrases. And we try to understand what kind of factors can influence the interpretation of those verbal phrases. So we have a sample from United States. Sorry, it's not a Singaporean local study. And uh, um, we test a certain number of verbal phrases. Some of them are affirming direction, like certainly, definitely, likely, probably. And we also have a refuting phrase, which are impossible, no chance, unlikely, and probably not. And uh, we vary the framing, so we pair the phrases with positive outcome and sometimes with negative outcome, try to get a bigger picture on how people actually interpret those phrases on the different scenarios. And then we have six different medical scenarios and health-related scenarios. And uh, because of this uh, 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 session is about uh, acid, like uh, uh, clinical trials, so I just show, and we, we did have an example about a clinical trial. So here is an example question, and we ask people relevant to the clinical trial. So suppose a person participates in a clinical trial for treating an infection, and uh, the doctor says the person would likely to experience adverse effects. And uh, then we ask participants uh, who are the readers of the sentence, based on information, based on information provided by the doctor. And how likely do you think the person in this scenario will experience adverse effect? We also capture other individual different factors, such as anxiety, health literacy, and the pride belief, and the individual's 
general reliance on experts. So here is the result for the clinical trial example. And uh, we see people's rating for the certainly, definitely, likely, and probably. There's no single number, right? It's all spread out. Even for the definitely, you see a long tail here. Some people think that definitely means 75 percentage or even 50 percentage. And the same as certainly. And the more people think it's 75 percentage rather than 100 percentage. You see greater variability when it's about likely and the probability. Although it's general, it's higher than the 50 percentage, but you see a huge widespread in the, in the, uh, in the ratings. And, uh, it's similar for the refuting phrase. It's better than the affirming phrase in terms of certainty. Definitely more people think impossible is 0%, zero percentage chance, and no chance is a zero percentage. But you still see some people do not think it's a zero percentage. And for the, for the probably not and the unlikely, you see greater variability in people's interpretation. Now I will just quickly go through the key finding. I will wrap up the talk. So, and in general, the key thing is that people vary their property judgment of the outcome described by verbal phrase and communicated by doctors. And then we also found people's prior belief of this outcome probability is the major predictor of their interpretation in those scenarios. And when they are in the state of uncertainty, they are rely on, on experts and can actually reduce the effect of prior Believe. So if they have a tr high trust in doctors, they may less enforce by the prior bias in the scenario. So they can be more rely on the information presented to them rather than their own knowledge and belief. And also we observe in the figures, refuting phrase seem to provide more reassurance when information was communicated by the doctors. So in the literature, we observe that when it comes to warning and recommendation, verbal phrase can also convince attitudes and belief that can influence the recipient's decision making. So for a doctor, when you see likely things likely to happen and unlikely to happen, you not only communicate the likelihood, but you also commit your recommendation, whether you are com recommend for a decision or against a decision. So I just quickly summary only three points. Sorry for being over a bit over a time. And so in general, Informed consent is challenging in RCTs, including comparative trials. And uh, as uh, like uh, for both of the sessions, information sheet and then consent forms, um, and the communication from doctors may not necessarily facilitate consent givers' comprehension. Sometimes it even can become barriers of understanding. And uh, people's risk perception of an RCT can be influenced by many factors unrelating to the RCT. Okay, this is the end of my presentation, and I also want to thank all the students and the collaborators being involved in this project. So the, the second speaker is uh, Professor Jerry Menikoff. He will be speaking on risk levels in comparative effectiveness uh, trials. Uh, Jerry is a professor of bioethics with us here at the Center for Biomedical Ethics um, at NUS. He is also a senior fellow at the uh, law faculty at NUS, and uh, he's trained in both law and medicine. Um, and he's been involved in the ethics and regulation of research with human beings for a long time. And uh, prior to joining us, he was uh, the director of the Office of Human Research Protections uh, at the NIH in the US. So please join me in welcoming Jerry. Um, so this is gonna be a little different. Uh, I'm gonna sort of drill down on, well, the broad concept of comparative effectiveness trials, applying the concepts that we've already been talking about in terms of consent, conveying risk, uh, trying to understand what level of risk a particular type of trial is about. And I'm in particular going to give you one example of uh, a fairly prominent, at least in the US, comparative effectiveness trial. Um, you might think that comparative effectiveness, this is pretty straightforward, shouldn't be that complicated. And it worked out that this one trial has generated a lot of controversy. It's continuing to generate controversy 10 years after it took place. So it'll be interesting to kind of see 
you know, what you guys think of this dispute. Basically, I'm going to talk about one question, right? Uh, yes, see here. So what are the risks um, in comparative effectiveness trials? Um, and so what are we talking about when we're talking about a comparative effectiveness trial? We're talking about a trial in which it's, I'm going to be talking about randomized trials, and in particular, assume that every arm of the trial is a version of a standard of care. So whatever your medical problem is, you could have gone to a doctor, they could have given you the treatment that's being used in each of the arms, uh, it would have been perfectly okay, it wouldn't have been malpractice. Um, you could guess from sort of hearing that description of what's going on in a trial, it sounds like maybe it's a pretty low risk trial, unlike sort of some trial where you're studying some drug that's not be, been approved anywhere in the world. It's some innovative drug. Who knows what horrible side effects it might have? Who knows how it, good it's going to be for the treatment? Whereas here, again, every arm is a standard of care. We kind of already are, are letting doctors use it. It sounds almost intuitive. Maybe this is a pretty low risk trial. If you go to the European Union, they have actually special categories for this type of research where they say it's sort of lower risk than other types of trials, and that makes sense. Um, I'm going to sort of again describe one particular case study, and from that case study, going to at least suggest to you maybe it isn't that obvious that these trials are such low risk trials. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, Here's the definition of minimal risk, um, and I'll say more about it, but whether something is minimal risk or not is actually a big deal in a lot of regulatory systems. It's a bigger deal in the US system than it is here, but it's somewhat of a big deal in Singapore too. Certain conclusions in terms of how we regulate clinical trials do depend on whether a trial is no more than minimal risk or could be more than minimal risk. Anyhow, it sort of talks about what? The level of harm and discomfort no greater than that ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine educational, physical, or psychological tests. Uh, my example that I like to use is often like a blood draw, right? Most of us would consider drawing blood as a pretty ordinary day-to-day -day, you know, thing that could happen in terms of seeing your doctor, and it's not particularly risky. Most of us do not. It's pretty, pretty rare that some really, really bad thing, bad thing happens to you from, from getting a blood draw. Um, okay, so right, I was talking a little bit about this. What are the consequences? of a, a trial being determined to involve risks that are no more than minimal. Um, in terms of informed consent, since that's obviously the, the theme of, of today's talks, uh, you are clearly sending a particular message when you're trying to enroll somebody into a clinical trial and you say, this is no more than minimal risk. I think the message you're commonly telling the person is don't worry about enrolling or not that much. You can enroll, you could help us out by helping answer some important medical question, and no very bad thing is going to happen to you. That pretty much is sort of the message that it makes sense. Now, Yeon could tell us exactly what people study, what people understand when they hear that message, but this is probably pretty much a standard message we would think we're sending, right? No very bad things will happen to me, don't worry about it, just enroll in it, help us learn this. Um, in the US, there's another separate regulatory consequence, um, which is, is pretty important, which is that if indeed a trial involves no more than minimal risk, if some other criteria are met, you also may be able to waive informed consent. So you could basically enroll people in the trial and they may not even know they're in a clinical trial. And the rationale, again, other criteria have to be met, but the big ticket criterion is you're not gonna do anything bad to them. It's a minimal risk trial, okay? It's like a blood draw. Nothing bad is gonna happen to any of these people. So those are the issues we're talking about here. Um, so now let me talk about the trial. Um, it's a trial called SUPPORT. I don't know how many of you by, have, have heard about SUPPORT. Okay, not, not too many. <laughs> this is good, okay. Because I, I talk about support a lot. Um, it involves premature infants. Um, 
and they often need supplemental oxygen, right? When, when you're very premature uh, as an infant, your lungs are, are the part of your body that is least developed, and they're just not really good at exchanging oxygen and getting into your bloodstream. Um, so we discovered, or the doctors discovered, this was way back in the 1940s, so more than 75 years ago, they figured out that if you give supplemental oxygen to these infants, uh, they could be kept alive. And it was a wonderful breakthrough. We were suddenly keeping lots of premature infants alive when they would otherwise have died. So this was wonderful. Um, but as they started doing this, they discovered some of these infants were developing eye problems. The, the blood vessels inside the back of the eye would be growing, overgrowing inappropriately, and they would clog up the inside of your eye and they would become fibrotic and you couldn't see. I mean, obviously, because you had all these growths inside your eye blocking the retina, the back of your eye, where you would sort of create images. Um, and this is a new type of medical problem, and it took them a while to figure it out, but some bright doctors eventually did some randomized trials. Again, this was over 75 years ago, and figured out it was the oxygen that was somehow your body, you know, an infant's body was not designed to be breathing in a really, really high percentage level of oxygen. And that oxygen just caused cells to overgrow. And it, it was originally called, called something different, but eventually got renamed as retinopathy of prematurity. The, the back of your eye, your retina is, is overgrowing. Um, Okay, so bottom line, this is a serious problem. It still is a serious problem. Obviously, horrible thing if these infants become blind at the very start of their lives. Um, many, it depends on what you think many is, but quite a few clinical trials have been conducted uh, to figure out what's the best level of oxygen. And um, as of 2005, when this trial that I'm about to talk to you about, support, started getting conducted, we still didn't know the best level of oxygen. And let me tell you more about why it's an issue. Um, so this is a, a study that, at least in the US, was funded by the NIH, a very prestigious trial. It was very expensive. Um, it actually took place, you know, I, I implied that yeah, these, these premature infants could develop this horrible ROP problem. Not a huge percentage of them develop it. But obviously, if you're having millions of kids being born every year, and if a lot of them are getting extra oxygen, it's still a lot of kids that are exposed to the, the problem. So you actually needed a lot of infants to be enrolled to figure out what's going on. So this ultimately took place in five English-speaking countries, um, as described. They wanted 1,300 infants to be enrolled. Um, and basically what they were doing was randomizing the infants uh, to either a lower level of oxygen, and I'll say more about what these levels mean, 85 to 89%, or a higher level, uh, 91 to 95%. Um, and, and just an important aspect of this, because remember I'm talking about comparative effectiveness. By definition, there has to be an acknowledgement either arm of the study would have been within the standard of care. They were basically all levels of treatment that a doctor could have given at the time and would not have been malpractice. So let's accept the claim that the range of 85% to 95% was within the acceptable range of oxygen levels you could have put an infant on as of the start of the trial, as of uh, 2005. So let's just accept all that. Okay, so the trial takes place. Again, everybody was randomized either a little bit on the low side, a little bit on the high side. Um, after it's completed, this US regulatory agency we'll call it OHRP, received a complaint about the trial. Um, and in particular, it was a complaint, well, it was a complicated complaint um, in terms of understanding exactly what the complainant was complaining about. But, but as the agency reviewed what was going on, 
um, the conclusion on the regulatory side was there was a consent problem. So this fits in very well with what we're talking about today, that the consent form didn't do a really good job in telling participants about what was going on in the trial and particularly about the risks. Uh, so the consent form stated that there were no specific risks relating for, to resulting from the infants being randomized to low oxygen versus high oxygen. I mean, it, it, it pretty much said exactly that. Um, and here we have a quote from it. It suggested this was a minimal risk study because both arms of the study were standards of care and thus there was, quote, no predictable increase in risk for your baby. So it, it sounds very reassuring, right? No predictable increase in risk. You know, you shouldn't worry a lot about whether your baby got assigned to low risk, to low oxygen or high oxygen. Um, just to tell you some other things that later happened, this turned into a big to-do. I'll tell you about how, more about how big a to-do is. But at one point, there was like a public hearing about it, and people were invited to come. This was in a part of the US government. Um, and oh, some parents of some of the infants in the study uh, spoke at that point. They were actually, some of them, these parents, were involved in lawsuits against the researchers. And what they said, because this gets back to sort of, as Yian was talking about, how do people who we enroll in clinical trials understand the risks of being in those trials? So one set of parents, I think the mom indicated, we had just given birth to this very premature infant who had, due to their own medical condition, lots of problems, breathing, being kept alive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they come to us and tell us about, there's this wonderful clinical trial, and it's called support. And it's like, it's giving support to us who are already parents of, you know, we're, we're very nervous. How wonderful it is to be enrolling our infant in the support trial where we'll get more support. That was the message being conveyed. So anyhow, so you'll hear more about it. So what happens at that point? Well, the New York Times and the Washington Post um, end up having front page stories about the, this government agency finding that there were consent problems in this clinical trial. Um, the New York Times actually then followed that up later in the week with an editorial. It thought this was so horrible that it wanted to editorialize and, you know, condemn the government and saying NIH, very bad that you, you know, funded this trial and, or, you know, at least had bad consent as part of it. Um, well, so what I'm mainly going to talk about now is the flip side of this, because the moment this got all that negative attention from being on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post, the research community was very unhappy about that. And so everything I'm going to tell you from now on is the pushback the way that many, many people in that community wanted to demonstrate that this regulatory finding was wrong, there was nothing wrong with the trial, the consent was fine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and, and so here I'm just listing you for you, there's a lot more. Uh, the New England Journal in particular, the editor-in-chief was very, very unhappy with the regulatory conclusion thought it was totally wrong, thought it was a huge problem that would discourage or make it hard to do important types of research. So what happened is there were many, many things published in the New England Journal that he was probably promoting these that were all condemning what was happening in the trial, what, what was condemning what the regulatory agency did. Um, and in particular, so one of the articles, right, I guess the third bullet, the director of the NIH and his colleagues um, basically wrote a piece. Okay. Um, anyhow, so they're condemning this. Let me go, go through this more quickly. Um, oh, so this one is, I think this is, was huge from my viewpoint. I was in the US government working actually for this agency at the time. And one of the other things that came out was a letter signed by 50 of the top bioethicists in the US basically saying, yeah, this regulatory agency was just totally wrong. Nothing wrong with this trial. Uh, the conclusion that this studies, uh, et cetera, 
expose subjects to additional risk above the risks of routine clinical treatment is not supported by the evidence. Again, they're basically saying this was a low risk trial. What are you guys, you know, you regulars thinking about? So let me show you what this study was trying to do. And, and these are guesstimates on my part, but I want to show you some curves that I think are kind of hinting at what was happening in the trial. Okay. First thing you have to determine, you're doing a randomized trial. You're changing the care somebody gets. They get certain care in the trial. You have to compare it to what would have happened to them if they weren't in the trial. So I'm taking the wording from the Duke consent form. We're in Singapore, we have Duke NUS. Hopefully people have a good impression that people at Duke are actually pretty good. And they actually said in their consent form they were participating in this trial. And they basically said, you know, most infants are kept in the middle of this range because there are concerns on either end. I'll tell you about those concerns in a minute. And so that, I'm just giving you a, an estimate of sort of a bell-shaped curve. Most of the infants would be somewhere in the middle, okay? Um, now let's remember what was happening in the trial. 50-50 were randomized to the lower oxygen end, to the higher oxygen end. Well, on the lower oxygen end, you'd be in the blue range. In the higher oxygen end, you'd be in the red range. So let me tell you, before the trial was conducted, remember we didn't know, you know what the right best level is. Why didn't we know the right level? Because there were actually concerns on both ends. On the high end, you already know about, we were concerned if there's too much oxygen, the infant could go blind, okay? So that's the concern. Maybe moving an infant from 90 to that red range, you might be increasing the likelihood that the infant went blind. Well, what about the low end? Remember the reason way back 7,500 years ago infants died when they were premature? They didn't have enough oxygen. The way we keep them alive is giving them oxygen. If you don't give them enough oxygen, maybe they're going to die. In addition, they might be kept alive, but they might end up with permanent brain damage. So that was the concern, and the concern was, how do you find the sweet spot here? And that's obviously a difficult issue. Horrible things happen if you give too much oxygen. Horrible things happen if you give too little oxygen. So just putting it all together, what the trial was doing was taking infants somewhere kind of around the yellow range and randomizing them 50-50 to the blue or red. Um, they were doing that because that's what you do in clinical trials. You need to separate the two groups. You want to get a statistically significant difference, detect that. Um, does that sound like a minimal risk trial? Uh, a lot of us don't think that's minimal risk at all. I suspect in Singapore, good IRBs around here, even not that good IRBs, would be unlikely to declare this minimal risk. Uh, bottom line, just because every arm in a clinical trial is a version of standard care, you want to then compare the two arms, you could still have two arms that are very, very different from one another. Um, no rule guaranteeing these are standard care. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to skip a lot of this stuff. It's giving you more of the... So there was more of a fight afterwards uh, when, when eventually guidance was put out explaining why some of these studies are more than, than minimal risk. Um, and, okay, so then things shifted to another type of trial, which is... Uh, instead of talking about this type of trial, the people who were, who were opposed to the regulatory action in this trial suddenly started talking about, well, what if both arms, there's no known difference between the two of them? And in terms of efficacy and in terms of side effects, as far as we know, they have the same side effects, they have equal efficacy. Maybe that type of trial is minimal risk. And I actually agree that maybe, but it's interesting how the critics suddenly were shifting to a trial that sounded far more benign. That was not true in the support trial. Where actually, we had very real concerns about very different bad things happening on either end. And these are just examples of, of how people were just shifting the conversation. Oh, and this is, yeah, this is fascinating. They would actually 
educate the people who would, they would put in focus groups and say, is this trial minimal risk or not? And so this was what they would educate them about. Well, imagine there are three drugs, and A is good, and B is good, and C is good, and we have these three smiling doctors, and then they ask you, are you okay with this randomized trial taking place? Would you participate in it? And, and do you think it's risky? Are you okay with it at taking place, maybe without consent? Well, if this was true, I mean, there's no, you have three wonderful drugs with smiling doctors holding them up. You have no information, even the doctors have no information to pick among them. Maybe it does make sense that it, it really is minimal risk, okay? So it's just, from my viewpoint, a bad example, and it's not a good example of what was going on in, um, in that actual trial and support. Um, and this is just explaining, I don't think these are the trials we actually study these days. You don't pick drugs where we know they're all equivalent to each other as best we know. That's not what you go after in terms of doing expensive trials. Uh, yeah, so that's just kind of saying that. And so let me just end. Um, I want to now tie this into real other current day um, comparative effectiveness trials. Um, there are researchers in Singapore, Yian works with them as, as part of other teams, that look at antibiotic comparisons, right? We live in a world where a lot of our antibiotics are no longer working all that well. We're looking for more antibiotics. We're often wanting to compare antibiotics to one another. So here's a trial that was, came out in JAMA. Um, this was back in October of 2023, so less than a year ago, and it was comparing two antibiotics I think I tell you more here. Yeah, okay. So people were coming into a hospital with sepsis. Uh, they were clinically being treated with two types of drugs, cephalosporins or penicillins. And there was a concern that one of these categories of drugs could cause neurological problems. The other could cause acute kidney injury. And so this trial that they called ACORN randomized people to those, those two drugs to, to actually, there, there have been no head-to-head -head comparisons of them up to then, and you wanted to see which of them uh, was creating you know, worse problems in terms of side effects. And the results were published. Um, okay, so the, the patients were randomized to either, what, cefepime or piperacillin, tazobactam, and Interestingly, this trial, remember this is published in JAMA, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world within the last year. Um, and again, this is the type of trial that people in Singapore are doing, and certainly people in Southeast Asia are doing. Uh, they had four arguments that this was a minimal risk trial, and actually an institutional review board, an IRB, ended up agreeing with the arguments that this was minimal risk, and actually under the U.S. rules, remember under U.S. rules, you actually can waive consent in trials that are viewed as minimal risk when you meet some other criteria. They actually did this in this trial. Now, I will say this was done at uh, Vanderbilt University, which from my viewpoint and the viewpoint of some others is fairly aggressive in terms of having an IRB that goes pretty far out in terms of declaring trials to be minimal risk when other people would say they're not so minimal risk. Uh, but it's just interesting, some of these arguments, like number three, well, there's no prior high quality data suggesting that one of the drugs is superior to the other. Is that a really good argument to conclude it's minimal risk? Anyhow, the main takeaway lesson here is there are determinations being made as we talk about this in important trials that are ending up in JAMA saying this is minimal risk. Now, you might ask yourself, well, gee, the, you were concerned that one of these drugs maybe had an increased risk of kidney problems. The other one had an increased risk of neurologic dysfunction. Maybe it should be, be for the people who are enrolling in this trial to decide whether for research purposes they wanted to be randomized to one of these drugs or the other drug. But of course, they didn't get the chance to say that because this trial was wave, waiving consent. And so you might ask yourself, well, how different are the issues here compared to what happened in the support trial? Um, and I think conceptually, they're not all that different. So the bottom line is, there are interesting issues relating to risk levels in comparative effectiveness trials. Comparative effectiveness trials are actually very important these days. 
Uh, we're doing more and more of that around the world. Um, I think that's probably is that the end of the slides. Yeah, OK. So I'm, I'm actually on time. Um, so we're ready, I guess, for our, our panel discussion. Thank you.